maybe I ask, answer your question this way by saying I attribute my success to hard work, a lot of luck, and intuition. You know, the, uh, the hard work is easy to understand, luck is easy to understand, and intuition requires some explanation. So uh, I tell you two stories. You know, one, uh, back in the 60s, I don't know if it still pertains today, but if you completed your major and minor in college in three years, they allowed you to count your first year of medical or dental school towards your fourth year of college, and you got a separate degree. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was good with my hands. I'm the son of a plumber. My father came to America from Poland at the age of 13 as a plumber's apprentice. Um, and I, I took a physical chemistry in the summer of 1963 at University of Pennsylvania. That finished off my major, and I enrolled in the University of Pennsylvania Dental School. And after eight days, I started to wonder if I was pushing myself in the right direction. And that's kind of why I attribute this to intuition, which was a very traumatic time in my life. You know, I paid the dental school tuition for a year. I paid my room and board for a year. Uh, I was put on a guilt trip by the dean of the dental school who said, Mr. Cooperman, you deprived the 101st applicant of a dental education. How can you know after eight days? So I don't know after eight days, but I know that I'm not certain. I don't want to go down this path of a three-year dental education to find out that it's not for me. Right. So I uh, went back to Hunter College. I had to get permission to uh, matriculate back into the program at Hunter, which I, I got. And I had a year of electives available. It was my major and minor. My major was chemistry. My minor was math and physics. I was completed. And I took 10 courses in economics, got 10 A's, and never looked back. I found what interested me. So that's the first example of intuition, which was a very major decision. You know, I came from a very middle-class background. And to lose the kind of money I lost, in addition to the tuition and the room and board, uh, things had a way of disappearing in the labs. So they tell you to use your portable drill to drill your initials into all your equipment so things don't disappear. So I had $1,200 worth of dental equipment, which was useless. Uh, and uh, so that was intuition. And the second example, I'm very anal. You, you know, you told me to dial in at 1210. I dialed in at 1210. I'm very reliable. And uh, one of the few times in my life that I passed a deadline was when Goldman Sachs made me a job offer. And I'll explain. I was interviewing um, for a job uh, at a Columbia Business School in 1966. The Dow was a thousand at that time. The walls were crumbling on Wall Street because it was, a, you know, you can say you can measure the height of Wall Street by the number of crumbling walls. The more crumbling walls, the higher the street is. And I had, I was a very attractive package. I had a six month old kid while I was at school. And it was Beta Gamma Sigma, uh, National, uh, some other awards, uh, Beta Gamma Sigma, you know, the Business Honor Society. I was straight A's in finance at Columbia, and I was a serious student. I had 16 job offers, and Goldman wasn't the best. And I remember like it was yesterday, the guy that made me the job offer, very, very fine gentleman who's no longer alive, uh, Bob Danforth, came from Yankton, South Dakota. And he called me up and said, Lee, we're disappointed we haven't heard from you. Is there anything we could say? So I said, Bob, let me be honest with you. I'm broke. I have no money. Uh, Goldman is not the best offer I have financially, but I kind of liked, liked everybody I met. You know, can I make $25,000 in five years? And the reason I asked him that question was the offer was for twelve five, And uh, I was very familiar with the union carbide compound interest tables floating around at that time. And if you doubled in five years, it was 15% compound. And he gave me what turned out to be an understated answer. He said, if you work hard and keep your nose clean, I think you could do it. And I said, okay, Bob, I'm coming. <laughs> so I went to Goldman, and that was, again, intuition. Goldman was one of, the, one of the few firms in the business that didn't change their name, right? I could have gone to White Weld, I could have gone to Kuhn Loeb, I could have gone to Loeb Roads, you know, uh, Good Body and Company, you know, you name it. Mm -hmm. Goldman not only remained independent, but it was extremely successful. I was made a partner in 1976, the firm earned $40 million. When I retired in 1991, the firm earned $1.8 billion. They were up every year for the year I had my 14-year run as a partner. So I, I've been very lucky, but it's, it's intuition, it's, it's luck, and it's hard work. You know, I was the first guy in the office every day at 6.45 and, uh, you know, uh, close the lights and stuff like that. You know, and, and I'm the old-fashioned kind of guy. You know, the harder you work, the smarter you got. Right. So now you, you enjoyed this 25-year career at Goldman, and eventually uh, you became the chairman and CEO of uh, Goldman Sachs as a manager. So why, after reaching that, those heights, did you leave that prestigious seat 
to form Omega Advisors? Well, I got to a point where I really, uh, I wanted to manage money. What, what, what happened, you know, it's a little bit more story, but I'll go through it in more detail. Uh, Goldman, who was led by Gus Levy, uh, basically at the time, they had a view that brokers should do brokerage and money management should do money management. And they were very reluctant to get into the money management business. And I kept on banging on them saying, you're missing something. Look at Webster, Division of Kid of Peabody, Merrill Lynch Asset Management, CSFB Asset Management. Everybody's going into the business. It's a way of uh, going into a non-cyclical, non-capital intensive business. And finally, they decided to go into it and they asked me to lead it. You know, they said, would you leave the research department and start Goldman Sachs Asset Management? And uh, at that time, you mentioned I was number one II for nine years. What you didn't mention was I took over research in 1972. And before I left research, we were number one in Greenwich, number one in financial world, number one in the II poll as a firm in research. So, you know, when you're number one for nine years and you, you got your department to be number one for a long time, starting out of the basement, I was ready for a new challenge. And so I started Goldman Sachs Asset Management. Um, and after about a year, I wanted to start a hedge fund as part of the practice. And uh, the firm heard, you know, uh, hedge fund, I would get short investment banking clients to the firm. The clients have a problem, so they didn't want to do it. And right. I really got to the point where, you know, my wife uh, married 56 years, same woman, we met in college, basically said, you know, how old are you going to be and how rich are you going to be before you do what you want to do? So I decided I wanted to manage money, but I wanted to manage money in a different way. I wanted to be able to co-invest with the investors. So uh, I retired from Goldman. I was a consultant for my first year of retirement. I had a very good relationship with Goldman. I was managed a half a billion dollars for their pension plan when I retired from the firm. But the answer to your question in a very succinct way, I just wanted to manage money and not build businesses. Right. And so, so let's forward to today. So today, tell us a little bit about Omega and and maybe even Omega Advisor, what did you carry over from um, Goldman to Omega in terms of culture, principles, people, talent, whatever? Uh, what, what's I, only, your I only left with uh, two people with the firm's permission. Uh, I basically left with my secretary who retired, uh, I guess, after 9-11. She got very fearful of coming to New York and she didn't want to come to New York. So I said, well, why don't you sit home, watch CNN and get the shit scared out of you by watching TV all day. And I took a young man who was a junior analyst and regrettably at the very young age, I think maybe 25 years old, he got contracted leukemia and he died within the first year of our business. But what I took with me was a client focus, uh, uh, hard work. And I frankly, I preached, I preached total commitment, you know, uh, and that's been my whole career is total commitment. And it makes sense for me because, you know, investing was my vocation. It was my advocation. I enjoyed investing. It was a means of supplementing my income. So it was like an all in encompassing type what of thing. Do by, what do you mean by total commitment? What does that mean to you? Total commitment. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm 24 seven. You know, I told my clients, you can call me anytime you want, as long as you don't call me after 10 o'clock at night. <laughs> you know, I was available. I started the business. And I was very unique in certain respects. I put a provision in my partnership agreement that if I was to reduce my capital below 35 million, which was my opening capital, I have to notify you 90 days in advance of your decision of notifying me. Because so I found a deficiency in the hedge fund structure. What happens is you don't know what the general partner does until you get your financial statements in April of the following year. But you mm -hmm. have to make your decision 45 days generally before the end of the year. So I told people, I'm going to tell you in advance what I'm going to do, in advance what you have to tell me. Mm -hmm. uh, and I had a very reasonable fee schedule. I was 1 in 15, not 2 in 20. And I was always the largest investor in the fund. I was eating my own cooking. Wow, fantastic. So we're going to get back to what Omega looks like today. And just as we go... A mere know, shadow of itself. A mere sh <laughs> At the peak, I was 40 people. And now I have a CFO who's got an assistant uh, under him. I have a trader who doesn't trade with discretion. He executes my orders and he's got an assistant. Somebody, everybody's got an assistant, okay? Uh, I have a chief operating officer who functions as an attorney looking at all the deals I go into. Uh, and uh, I think- We'll get back have, to, we'll get back to the family office momentarily. We'll get back to it. But what I really want to do, so two things I want to say. Number one, first of all, for all the participants, as um, in lieu of uh, the video, which we've kind of um, been having some challenges with, what you'll see on the side 
Um, you'll see some associated polls on the left screen for the next bunch of questions. Again, try to uh, uh, engage each of you. And um, I encourage each of you to participate to see how your peers would respond to some of the questions that I'm posing to Leon right now. So I'll try to make reference to the polls as we go, but um, that's number one. Number two, Leon, Lee, for you, um, I, I hope I'm not insulting you by saying that you know, you've seen many different markets, good and bad. And in your career, I mean, you, you, you've you kind of navigated the challenges of the 70s, 87, 94, 2001, 2008. So what risk management lessons have you gleaned that perhaps other investors who haven't uh, experienced these cycles should be considering? Well, I think the whole market structure has been destroyed. You know, there's no structure. I wrote a letter two years ago to Jay Clayton, head of the SEC, and I explained to him uh, that they've ruined the structure of the market. When I joined Wall Street 55 years ago, Goldman Sachs, Morgan Stanley, Merrill Lynch, those guys traded stocks at 50 cents a share and the Volcker rule didn't exist. So basically uh, the brokerage firms had an incentive uh, to uh, basically stabilize markets and carry inventory. Now they can't carry inventory because of the Volcker rule and there's no economic incentive because there's no commissions to reward them. Mm -hmm. That's one change. The second change, frankly, is a specialist system. When I joined Wall Street, 80% of the volume was at the, done at the New York Stock Exchange. Now, 80% of the volume is done off board. And so the specialist system is not a functioning, stabilizing force. And then uh, finally is the uptick rule. You know, in 1938, they instituted the uptick rule, required an uptick to short a stock uh, to help stabilize markets. It worked effectively for 70 odd years. And in 2007, for some unexplained reason, they eliminated the uptick rule, which gave rise to all these quantitative trading systems, which know nothing whatsoever about value. They know everything about price. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, I'll tell you a little anecdotal story, which, you know, I'm not, you know, uh, dumping on anybody, but, I, 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 you know, during the 2008 crisis, I bought a stock called Arbor Realty, ABR, at two bucks. Mm -hmm. I got very friendly with the CEO. I went up actually lending the company money at one time and they paid me back. Everything was fine. Stock goes from two to 16. He calls me up when the stock drops from 16 to 12. He says, Lee, I don't know what's going on with my stock. You know, business is pretty good. Uh, my dividend, I think, is secure, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. The dividend was $1.20 at the time. It was, uh, the stock was yielding 10%. He owns 25% of the company. The next day, the next day, the stock drops to $5. This was during the meltdown period of March. Mm -hmm. I call him up and say, what the hell's going on, Ivan? His name is Ivan Kaufman. He says, I don't know what to tell you. I'm sitting on $500 million of excess capital. That's the market cap of the equity market cap of the company. Uh, my business is good. The vast bulk of my loans are workforce housing, I mean, apartment lending. He's leveraging you know, four and a half, five to one. Um, and my dividend of $1.20, I think is secure. So I said, Ivan, if I was you and I own 25% of the company, I would stop making loans and I would be buying back my stock at you know, half a book value, yielding over 20%. The next day, he announced a $100 million buyback. The stock trades to three and three quarters from mm -hmm. five. Wow. Now, in the world I grew up in, when the company announces a buyback that equals 20% of the market cap of the company, stock goes up. And when I found out, uh, the, the stock was in structures, you know, Citadel, these 10 to 1 leverage structures, when they had a delever, they just throw the inventory out the door. So I would say um, the market has changed. I think well, I'm advantaged. I'm advantaged by not being in the business anymore because I'm running my own capital. I don't have to worry about quarterly performance. You know, well, I can be patient. Investors, what is what are those changes, particularly like the the absence of inventory and so on? What does that mean for investors? More volatility, more volatility, and more index trading, and people that don't know what they own. And they're just trading pieces of paper. And hmm. so if you, if you understand what you're doing and you can hold your wits about you, I think you could uh, uh, do very well. I'll give you another example, just uh, three weeks old. You know, uh, my colleague, uh, good friend, Sam Martini, I give him 100% credit for being right here. And I just was following his recommendation. He was doing work on a mortgage uh, company called uh, Mr. Cooper. Mm -hmm. Okay. And the stock was trading at $14.00. Uh, it only had one person in the street recommending it. Everybody else had like a $12, $13 price target and didn't, didn't appreciate what was going on at the company. The company three weeks ago reported earnings in the quarter 
of $500 million in a quarter, which equals 50% of the equity market cap of the company in one quarter. Overnight, everybody went from a $12 price objective to 25. Earnings estimates went from like three or four to seven. Uh, and I got lucky to see, uh, I guess two days ago, uh, S&P put them in the 600 index. So that's helping. And the stock has gone from like 14 to 21. And nobody's doing their homework. What, my, what Sam Martini figured out was anybody could figure it out, they would do the homework. So I, I think that the growth of this indexation and quantitative trading systems gives the guy or gal a edge who's got the ability to do independent research. Hmm. And so how, if we think about kind of uh, that thesis and we think about um, the dynamics in the market today, how do you marry some of those market distortions, some of the issues that you've raised with what's happening with the crisis? And, you know, maybe you could also chat on whether this crisis that you're seeing how different it is. Obviously, it's different, but how truly different it is from oh, the totally different. And I, this is my eighth business cycle and bear market cycle t tied to the business cycle that I've been through. This is the only one in history that they shut down the economy, which I think was an enormous mistake. I said at the time, they should have given special assistance to the uh, elderly people, the at risk people, and people that were too nervous to go to work. But the broad scale shutdown of the economy was a big mistake. It runs the risk of some kind of rolling depression. And um, I think that they made an enormous mistake. So this is totally different than anything else I've gone through. Mm -hmm. Totally different. And, um, and where do you think other investors will be surprised? We have lots of surprises that we've seen so far. Where do you think the surprise? Well, I think the surprise to me is, and again, uh, you know, don't put this in stone, but I think the market won't be much different three years now from now than it is today. I think that uh, uh, I'm going to read you something I sent to somebody just yesterday who was asking me the same question you asked me. My view is simple. The economy has been on some form of life support since 2008. This should reduce PEs, all things being equal. We never made it out of QE, and now it's free money for a long time. No one seems to care about massive debt being created. I am. Lastly, multiples are a function of growth rates, confidence, and interest rates. Future growth is likely to be less than historical given the need to allocate more of income to debt service. And I think it's fair to say confidence in the future is less. I'll elaborate on both those points in a second. That leaves us with rates, which are clearly driving the market. Two observation, observations. One, if rates belong where they are, your returns in the stock market should be well under 5%. And second, central bank policy towards rates seems wrong to me. You know, um, we came into 2020 a fully employed economy and a trillion dollar deficit. Mm -hmm. What I learned in school is when the economy is fully employed, the deficit, the, the budget is supposed to be in balance. We have a president who's going to do everything he can to pull the man forward to get reelected. Okay. Um, this nation, our nation just celebrated its 244th birthday. It took 244 years to go from zero national debt to $21 trillion. And that's going up three or four trillion a year. That's a growth rate far in excess of the growth rate of the economy, which I think more and more of our income would have to be allocated to debt service. Right. Now, I don't believe in modern, you know, monetary theory, so maybe I'm wrong if it's right, but I'm, I'm very concerned. I caught a glimpse of uh, Stan Druckenmiller's interview this morning on CNBC uh, uh, featuring the Harlem Children's Zone, which I support for many, many years. Uh, and I, I'm in agreement with Stan. I think, you know, to think that there's no price to be paid for what we're running up here in debt is, I think, very naive. So my guess is that uh, next three or four years will be an environment of profits rising modestly, but price earnings ratios falling. Um, you know, I, I, I think it's clear that the government is involved in the system in unprecedented fashion. And when you rely upon the government to bail you out, the government has every right to control the upside. And that's where we're heading. The government is too involved in the system. Well, so, so that, that sounds like uh, that's more than a three to four year uh, challenge. I mean, you I said there was an interview where you said that the coronavirus, uh, coronavirus will likely change capital markets forever. Like maybe you could elaborate on what you meant by that. And how do you view also the impact of today's you know, sort of some of the demographic and sociopolitical dynamics and, and the impact of that on free market and capitalism. What I meant about COVID changing the environment was uh, 
the government, when the government is called upon to protect you on the downside, they have every right to regulate you on the upside. Okay. So uh, we've already seen examples of this. Some congressman comes out and says to the airlines, I don't want you flying more than 70% load factor. Okay. Well, there's no airline can make money. And he said, we have the right to tell you that because we bailed you out. Okay. Uh, and so I, I think if you rely upon the government to bail you out, the government has a right to have a say in how you conduct your future. So they'll have a right to tell you about stock repurchase and stuff like that. They'll have a, they, they've always had the right to basically, uh, you know, uh, tax you. But uh, I assume that no matter who wins the presidency, uh, tax is going to go up quickly if Biden wins, slowly if Trump wins. I think right. in America, we have two choices that are not the greatest choices. I think carried interest will go, capital gains taxation will be changed, the ability to roll over real estate tax uh, gains tax-free will be eliminated, you know, probably all for the good. Mm -hmm. you know, but uh, so what I mean by capitalism changing is I think the government has the right to play a greater role because of what they've done in bailing us out. And, and how about some of the, uh, just the demographic and socio-political dynamics too, too, uh, too long term to me, uh, you know, uh, uh, I, I, that stuff trains, trade, changes very glacially. Uh, and the market has a way of overly discounting things. So, for example, I think the energy group is maybe three or four percent of the S&P, down from probably 20, 25 percent uh, when project independence was a hot thing in the, in the mid 70s. Um, so, you know, I tend to go with cash flow free cash flow, you know, and stuff like that. And uh, I think the longer term ESG and stuff like that is very long term in nature. And uh, I, I tend to look more, I invest with the business cycle. Right. And so uh, uh, let me ask you another question. You know, recently uh, there was a, you were on Forbes or CNBC, I believe saying that FANG stocks that you own are, uh, they quoted you as saying that uh, they are better than gold. Well, let, let me elaborate in more detail. Uh, let me elaborate in more detail. This is a very important question. We are really in a market of stocks rather than a stock market. A market of stocks rather than a stock market. And I have identified three markets that are out there. The first market, which you referenced, is the FANG market, where I say they're better than gold. These are the companies that are benefiting from the pulling forth of the forward of demand uh, due to the uh, coronavirus, you know, it's the Googles, it's the Apples, it's the Facebooks, it's the Microsofts and companies like that. And when you take the current interest rate environment applied against these 15% type growers, uh, are they expensive? Yes. Are they outlandishly so? No. Uh, you know, in 1972, I was around for the Nifty 50 when Carl Hathaway was the chief investment officer at J.P. Morgan, and J.P. Morgan and U.S. Trust philosophy was only the right stock at any price. And they didn't care about what they paid as long as it was a world-class growth company. The trouble is, there's a certain failure rate. And when the ones that fail, uh, you take away the return uh, from the overall return, it becomes a, a total uh, return that's very uninspiring. So let me give you some examples of Nifty 50, okay, Revlon, gone, okay, uh, it and very unsuccessful conglomerate in the end, JCPenney, insolvency, IBM, was 35 times earnings back then, nothing like that now, Xerox, right. Lubrisol, uh, uh, sorry, Eastman Kodak, uh, Avon, Kmart, Polaroid, uh, Sears Roebuck, those were part of the Nifty 50, and these are companies that didn't make it. So I would say um, my, my problem, I own uh, Google is my largest position. I own Google, I own Microsoft, I own some Facebook, I own Amazon, uh, but I don't kid myself that they're cheap. Uh, they're cheap relative to interest rates, but I think interest rates are ridiculously low. The second market is the Robinhood market, and I think that's a joke. You know, if I tell you the price performance of Tesla and Apple after they announced their stock splits, and I point out to you that a stock split is no different than somebody giving you five singles for a $5 bill. It doesn't create any wealth. Uh, they, Carl Icahn was a brilliant uh, you know, trader, basically unloads his position in Hertz where he made a mistake at 72 cents a share. And three weeks later, the Robinhood crowd has got it at five bucks. 
of the enterprise value of American Airlines today is higher than it was prior to the COVID uh, situation because of the debt and the equity they've issued. It makes no sense. That's a crazy market that's going to end in tears. I said that on TV a couple of months ago, and regrettably, the very next day, some young man lost $700,000 day trading and he took his own life. The yeah. third market is the one I'm focused on, and you can find plenty of value, and that's everything else. It's the, the Mr. Coopers of the world. It's things that you can find that are very reasonably priced, but because maybe they're not in the index or they're less prominent in the index, um, they're not uh, a clear beneficiary of what's going on in the world, you know, the market tends to overlook them. So I, I spend my time looking in the third market, so to speak. Right. So I'm going to come back to that third market momentarily. But I do want to ask, earlier you mentioned in terms of the consequences of government intervention, there was a question that came up from one of the participants. Um, in terms of, Lee, what do you think will be the result of the money printing that the Fed has done in response to COVID? And what does it all mean for the holders of cash, corporate bonds? Well, I would say I would, <laughs> I would hold as few bonds as you could hold and get away with it, meeting your, your actuarial needs. I think uh, bonds represent a, a return-free risk. You know, historically, the 10-year government bond is yielded in line with nominal GDP. And that they, if you have 2% real growth and 2% inflation, they're suiting for 2% inflation, that's 4% nominal. The 10-year would be realistically valued at 4%. Now, because of what's going on globally, um, it's not going to get there for a couple of years. But I, I have no interest in bonds. I have a large family office. My uh, fixed income play is in a handful of high yield stocks and in uh, basically high yield bonds where I know the underlying credit, where I'm getting nine, 10 percent and I know the credit. But um, I would say that, look, the government's policy is pushing everybody out on the risk curve. Uh, the person that uh, is strictly a T-bill buyer concluded a while ago, I can't survive on near zero. So I'm gonna take duration risk, I'm gonna buy T-bonds. The T-bond player says, I can't survive on 70 basis points, I'm gonna buy industrial credits. The industrial credit guy says, well, I can't survive in three or 4%, I'm gonna buy high yield. The high yield guy says, I can't make it on six or 7%, I'm gonna buy structured credits, CLOs, because of their opacity, uh, they tend to yield more. And the, right. uh, the CLO buyer says, well, I'm going to take 25% of my fund and put it in equities. And that's what's been going on. So I would assume that sometime in the next two or three years, sooner rather than later, we'll probably start to come in on the risk curve. Mm -hmm. And I would expect inflation to go up, but it's going to take a while. Uh, and, I, I, and for the first time in my life, I would allow for the possible outcome of a deflationary outcome. You know, debt is growing so rapidly uh, that is going to really put a, 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 you know, a downward pressure on the economy because more and more of our national income has to be devoted to debt service. So I would not rule out a deflationary outcome. Right. So let, let me come back to that third bucket you just referenced a little bit ago. And I, I want to maybe frame it in the context of, you know, you left Goldman Sachs to be able to do the kind of investing you wanted to do. And then recently, I think in 2018, you returned all your investors' money and converted Omega Advisors into a single family office. So how, how is your investing philosophy or approach or uh, the type of investments you're making differently today than it was with Omega? Uh, what's unique? And, and, and maybe you could comment in that context around your investment philosophy and beliefs. Sure. Well, let me say this. Uh, what I told my, my friends, myself included, by the way, were shocked that I retired but I thought my time had come and they asked me how my life was going to change. Uh, and I told them that number one, I'm going to sleep an hour later in the morning. I used to get up at five fifty in the morning to schlep from Shore New Jersey to, uh, you know, Manhattan. I'm going to sleep an hour later in the morning. I'm basically going to get to the gym. You know, you've been very kind we have no video, but I'm, uh, I'm a chunky kind of guy and yes. I get to the gym and try to trim down and take better care of my health. Uh, I've, I've done the first two. The third thing I was going to do, I've not done at all. And that was, I was going to basically, I know how to, I have a very good card sense, uh, but I, uh, I, I, I don't know the bidding in bridge. And my wife plays bridge three, four hours a day. So I was going to take lessons and, and learn the bidding. But right. I'm so busy with what's going on in the market that I've not done that. 
the next thing I said I was going to do is, since my portfolio was very overweighted to marketable securities, and I think the market is reasonably fully valued, that I'm going to try to find more private deals and diversify into uh, private, you know, non-marketable securities. Mm -hmm. um, and lastly, because I'm, I pay taxes, you know, I'm going to try to be tax efficient in my investing. My investors didn't credit me for tax efficiency, so I intended to uh, trade. But uh, pers privately, I would try to be more tax efficient. Okay. No, thank you. And so let me let me come back to something else you mentioned earlier. You talked earlier about the um, the some of the mispricings and and uh, things that aren't being captured by the index. So just in that regard, you know, if you look at active uh, equity managers versus passive uh, in basically index strategies, uh, clearly, you know, the passive uh, approach has uh, outperformed over the last, just call it eight to 10 years. Uh, what is your take on that active, active passive debate? And is the active equity selection less relevant today than it was in previous years? Or you think that that, that, that comeback is happening? I, I think it'll come back. Uh, let me explain it this way. If you came to me in 2008 and said, Lee, you got an excellent reputation, uh, you've done well as an investor, I want to go into a hedge fund. And I said to you, you don't want to be in a hedge fund. You want to be in a relative return vehicle because we're in store for a 10-year bull market run in a 10-year bull market in the economy. And in a hedge fund, you don't, you're not fully invested. You have a short book, which tends to work against returns often. Uh, you would probably lock me up and throw away the key after 2008. Right. Okay, that's exactly what happened. Now we've had this 10-year bull run and investors are saying, Christ, I could have gotten a better return by being in some passive index. Who the hell got to pay you some variation of two and 20? Right. Uh, I can get that return, a superior return for free. You know, Fidelity has an index fund that you can go in for free. Sure. Uh, the question we all have to ask ourselves, and I don't know the answer, but my, uh, my persuasion would be now is not the time to go into a, an absolute return, uh, you know, a relative return vehicle. I, I think we're in store for a two-way market. I think, uh, uh, you know, uh, I would want to be with a, a, a person that has shown a talent for extracting profits from the market long and short. I don't think it's a one-way market anymore. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But you know, that's an opinion, and I, I'm not selling anything. I'm, I'm, I'm objective. Uh, you know, uh, if I was in the business, you can basically, and looking for assets, you could question me. If I'm wrong, I'm objectively wrong. I'm not biased. Let me ask you just in terms of where your own money is going. I, I, first of all, are you allocated to hedge funds? And um, are you comfortable paying uh, the kind of the traditional fee structures? Is, is No, I, I think 2% uh, uh, for showing up for work and 20% is something I wouldn't pay. And uh, I have a history of that. Uh, of not going into those kind of hedge funds. Uh, I do have money with hedge funds. Uh, I actually have money with a fund of funds where I'm the largest investor. Uh, I'm feeling at age 77 less competitive. Uh, I want to enjoy my money. You know, I, I've, you mentioned the giving pledge. The, what you didn't mention is I told Warren Buffett that I intend to give away all my money, not half. So I have two sons. One was very successful on his own financially. Both are good kids. One's a PhD scientist, so he doesn't have much interest in money, doesn't make much money, but he's got enough. And uh, his older brother was very successful, very smart Phi Beta Kappa graduate out of Stanford and uh, ran a hedge fund very successfully for many years and gave back his investment in money. I waited to age 76 to do it. He did it at age, I think, 50. <laughs> you know, everything happens quicker these days. But uh, I would say that... Uh, uh, did I answer your question? Uh, uh, well, I actually gave me an uh, answer to, to polar opposites. So on the one hand, you told me you're allocated to hedge funds. On the other hand, you basically told me that that fee structure is not... Well, I, 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 I allocate the hedge funds with the fee structure is acceptable to me. Right. Okay. Got it. Got it. <laughs> I, I have some special deals where I give somebody a decent sized sum of money and I get them to take on a hurdle rate and stuff like that. You know, I, 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 I'm not in anybody... I'm not paying anybody 2%. Right. Right. So um, you, you, I want to come back to something else. You, you referenced that you, you're projecting increased volatility in, in the markets. So um, is, that, is that primarily because of the inefficiency you referenced earlier? Is there anything else? And how should investors be thinking about it in terms of 
the approach they take to uh, handicap that? Well, basically, I think the volatility comes from the fact that the machines are making a decision, you know, and, uh, you know, they hear a certain word they buy, they hear a certain word they sell. You know, six months ago, believe it or not, the market fluctuated violently around the word China. The China relations could not be worse and nobody gives a shit, you know, is now the virus. In my opinion, the stock market's going to peak the day after the virus cure is found. Hmm. Because we have to start paying attention to the fiscal situation of the country. Mm -hmm. See, I think what it boils down to is, what do you think, in a, with the government involvement in the economy to the degree it is involved in, and with the debt buildup that's taken place, what do you think an appropriate multiple is for the S&P 500? And the highest I come up with in my mind is 20. And 20 allows for the increased presence of technology in the index. Mm -hmm. You know, it's actually a... a an index that is uh, biased towards success, they constantly change and they put more kind of successful companies in, they take out the less successful ones. So uh, I think normalized earnings in the S&P about 150, but 20 times 150 is 3,000 in the S&P, it's fair value, and we're already roughly 3,500. So I think, uh, you know, we're not outlandishly overvalued. And, and again, I get back to what I said right at the beginning of the session, uh, we're in a market of stocks. You know, you can find plenty of single digit multiple stocks in the, that are not prominently featured in the index. And I think that's where I try to make my money. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I'm motivated by free cash flow, you know, uh, uh, proper capital management, large insider ownership, and businesses that have been around for a couple of business cycles. I'm not, I'm not you know, an experimenter. I'm quite confident that the Nifty 50 today, they'll have a similar failure rate to Nifty 50 of 1972 and you take the amount of money you lose and the ones that don't make it and you subtract that re part of the return from the ones that make it uh right. you're not going to have a very attractive expected value right 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 um so you know if kind of some of the uh some of the themes have been i would say a little bit uh less than optimistic can i ask you what excites you about the future well, what I get excited about is finding something that somebody else doesn't see, making a bet and having Mr. Marker prove me right. So I own 7 million shares of Mr. Cooper at 10 bucks. It's trading over 20 now. Nobody saw it. Right. I, I made the bet. The biggest thing in my career was I discovered a guy by the name of Dr. Henry Singleton, who far and away was the smartest guy I ever dealt with. I visited with Dr. Singleton twice a year for 25 years. Okay. Uh, just to give you a little bit of a background, Teledyne uh, is a contraction of two Greek words, tele, which is distance, and dyne, which is force. So the literal translation of Teledyne is distant force. And was implied, what was implied by the name is, you know, we're a conglomerate, we have maybe 25 or 30 people in the home office. Uh, uh, the widgets are made out in the field. You return the cash to the home office and we decide what to do with it. So Singleton graduated number one in his class at Naval Academy, went on to get a PhD in electrical engineering at MIT. He was a senior executive at Litton Industries. Tex Thornton, the founder, made Roy Ash CEO over Singleton. Singleton left over that decision and he founded Teledyne in 1958. Mm -hmm. If you study the record carefully, what you find is from 1958 to 1968, he did 130 acquisitions, multiple arbitrage, took a high multiple conglomerate stock and bought lower multiple businesses. Where he distinguished himself was, I remember having lunch with him in Yamato's restaurant in the Century Plaza Hotel. And basically uh, he said to me, Lee, the acquisition game for Teledyne is over. It makes no sense to take undervalued auction market stock and pay private market value to buy businesses. You're not getting anywhere. So we're gonna stop acquisitions and we'll figure out what's the intelligent thing to do. At that time, Harold Janine, uh, George Softenberg, uh, uh, Fred Sullivan, those were conglomerates, Walter Kitty, City Investing, ITT, they kept on doing deals, pushing deals down people's throats, not creating any value because you were taking undervalued stock and paying private market value to buy businesses. Okay, then beginning in 1972, ending in 1984, on eight occasions, Singleton determined his stock was undervalued, did eight tender offers, and retired 90% of the capitalization of the company when nobody understood stock repurchase. Right. Okay. Three of the eight occasions, if you go check, I wrote a case study for Harvard 25 years ago, pointing out three of those eight occasions, he offered bonds in return for his stock, 
And when you look back, he, he picked the lower the interest rate cycle to put out bonds and, uh, the, you know, uh, which meant what he gave you, not because the credit of the company changed in any way, but basically because interest rates rose, what you took dropped in value. Mm -hmm. um, and then in 1972, in that bear market, again, he, when I met with him, he said, you know, Lee, everybody is selling stocks and buying bonds because they think the low risk asset of bonds, the world I see, I think the low risk asset is stocks, the high risk asset is bonds. It's a little bit like today, okay? Uh, except the multiples of the market aren't that low. And he went out and he bought, uh, I, I think I have, if you look, me, look into my desk for one second, uh, just bear with me. There, you can come back to it later. Yeah, no, I have it right here. Uh, just, uh, he went out and he bought 5% of Aetna, 22% of Brockway Glass, 8% of Cult Industries, 29% of Curtis Wright, 11% of uh, Navistar, 21% uh, of Walter Kitty, 28% of uh, Litton Industries, 22% of Reichel Chemical, so on and so forth, 8% of the USF and G, and uh, basically sold all the bonds he could sell and still be regulatorily compliant. Because he owned two insurance companies at that time, one called Unitrin, which is a publicly traded company was spun out, and another one called Argonaut, uh, which is also publicly traded. And, and so, Lee, what's the takeaway for today's investors? What's, what should today's uh, allocation? You know, stick with your discipline. You know, understand what you do. Do it well. Uh, there's no free lunch. Uh, and don't try to trade around. And, you know, one day you're a gross stock buyer. Next day you're a cyclical buyer. Uh, next day you're a defensive buyer. I just find that, you know, if you have a certain style and you stick with that style over a cycle, you'll come out fine. And, and so, you know, you've kind of mentioned um, a lot of uh, tremendous successes that you've, you know, you've talked about. And you've had, I got plenty of losers. Don't worry about that. So, so let me actually talk to you about it. One of the things you said, you know, is uh, you've said that in this business, if you don't make mistakes, you're either a liar or you don't take uh, many swings at the ball. So when you think about those losers, which ones were – would have been most instructive for you? What has been the uh, most instructive mistake you think you've ever made? I don't know that it's instructive, but it was very painful. I hired a guy at a Goldman Sachs um, um, and uh, made him in charge of emerging markets. Uh -huh. And uh, in 1997, uh, it was his second year with me, I paid him, I think, $15 million. He did a very fine job for me. In 1998, he led the firm into a deal tainted by corruption, unbeknownst by me and anybody else in the firm. He put us into a privatization deal in Azerbaijan, okay, which was a totally corrupt country. And he knew of the corruption. And I wound up with a Foreign Corrupt Practices Act issue I had to deal with. Uh, the firm was never found guilty of anything. Uh, because we weren't knowledgeable. He went to jail for a very short period of time. He never got the jail time he deserved, but uh, that uh, I had a billion dollar withdrawal over being duped by this guy. So um, what do you learn? You, know, yeah. you, <laughs> you, learn, you learn, if I show you his letter of employment, where he emphasized the importance of ethics to him, et cetera, et cetera. And he had a very favorable reference from when he left Goldman to join me. And, you know, and then he turned out to be a crook. What do you learn? Yeah. So you learn, you learn to expect you know, when something is too good to be true, it's not true. Well, that, that's for sure. Now, if you if you're thinking, let's say you're speaking to a younger version of yourself today, what would you say? What advice would you be giving? Well, I, I give I do a lot of talking with youngsters, and I tell them the only way to be successful is to do what you love and love what you do. Don't go into a field for money. You know. There was a while when all the hedge funds guys were on the top, you know, the front page of magazines, and everybody wanted to go into the hedge fund business. You know, you don't go into the, a business for money. You go into a business because you have a passion about it, you have an understanding about it, you have an aptitude for it. You know, I've never, uh, you know, the money was a byproduct. I didn't go to Wall Street to make a lot of money. I had no money. I went to work for twelve thousand five hundred dollars. Uh, I enjoyed what I did. I never looked at uh, my hard work as work. I enjoy going to work. You know, my friend Marvin Schwartz at Newberger Berman, he said to me many years ago, he likes Sunday evenings better than Saturday evenings because on Sunday evenings, he's only have to wait one day for the market to open. On Saturday, he's got to wait for two days. Mm -hmm. So, you know, uh, I have a, a passion about what you're doing. 
So decide what you like. You know, right. if you don't like working with numbers um, and thing, and you don't like working, well, I say, if you don't like working with numbers, don't go into the world of security analysis because it's all about numbers. You know, Ben Graham, intelligent investor, said that you evaluate management twice in your decision-making process. Once through the numbers, obviously, you know, return on equity, growth rate, market share, profit margins, or all measure management, and you, you, you measure management and you're face-to-face -face inter interchange with them, asking them questions, see how they respond to questions. Singleton was a tough one. They called him the Sphinx, basically. He always said to me, Lee, I don't know why you come back to constantly visit me. I never tell you anything. And uh, I just to hear him opine on certain things that are non-specific to the company, but about the world, uh, I found very interesting. So, so um, I actually want to elaborate on that a little bit. Just what role has a uh, study of perhaps other disciplines or, you know, uh, kind of the lattice work of, of other sciences, as, as Munger would point out, what, what role has that played in your investment philosophy? Well, my majoring in chemistry and mind and math and physics basically gave me a framework to think analytically. Mm -hmm. uh, that was very, very important. You know, uh, uh, I would say that uh, I tell the young people today, um, hold on, I have another handout. Let me find it. Let me come... And I'm going to come back to it. I want to use it now because it's relevant. Uh, what I tell people when I uh, talk to young folks, yeah, uh, I, I actually don't have it. But what I look for uh, in terms of uh, hiring people, um, you know, an analytical framework, uh, a, a total commitment to the business. I mentioned that. Uh, good use of computers, ability to write. Hold on one second. Hello, who is this, please? Hey, hi, Jody. I'm on a conference call with 200 people. Can I call back? Okay, wait. Okay, thanks. That's my daughter-in-law. <laughs> yeah. yeah you, you couldn't, can't have a nicer daughter-in-law than I have. She's terrific. <laughs> but I would say analytical framework, total commitment, ability to work with numbers. Ability to work with others, etc. Yeah, well, let me ask you. Just um, I, I want to just come back to one thing that you mentioned earlier on. You you kind of uh, made the case that um, equities are probably fully valued. That uh, bonds and fixed income is is uh, a risk without return. So what you know, this is a question from uh, from one of the participants. Is you know what are some of the defensive uh, assets in your portfolio today? Like. Other than the... Uh, the well, my biggest position, which is a 20% position, is a bond. Okay? And uh, I'll go on record. It, it, it's, it's a no-brainer, in my opinion. It's a company called Legato. Uh, Legato, the equity is owned by J.P. Morgan, Centerbridge, Phil Falcone, and Fortress. Mm -hmm. What trades publicly are pick bonds. They have a first lien bond outstanding that is trading at 85 cents a dollar, I think with a 13% coupon. The bond matures December 7th of this year. Hmm. Okay, there's a research firm that came out with a report yesterday. They, the, the low end, what they, what they have as an asset is they own 5G spectrum. The world needs more 5G spectrum. They spent almost a decade with the FCC getting approval for the spectrum. By a vote of five to zero, a bipartisan FCC, meaning Republicans and Democrats, approve the use of the spectrum. This research firm, I forget the name of it, I don't do much business with them, somebody sent me a report, said the low end value of the spectrum was $12 billion. The chairman of the board of Legato is Ivan Seidenberg, former head of the uh, Verizon. Uh, another member of the board is Reed uh, uh, Hunt, former head of the FCC. Okay, the bonds traded 85 have a 13 coupon that matured December 7th. The total value of the bonds are two and a half billion. And this research firm says the low end value of the spectrum is 12. And they see certain scenarios, which I think are ridiculous, to the spectrum could be worth 23 billion. Mm -hmm. Okay, the bonds would have to be refinanced and paid off in December. And I think the value of the spectrum uh, more than covers it. They have a second lien, which trades at like 50 cents on a dollar. I think they're also worth par, but they're gamier because they may be equitized. But I would say uh, 
I don't know that it's defensive, but I'll, I'll tell you my positions. I have a 3% position Amazon, 4% position Ashland Global Holdings, which we think of take out. We've been accumulating a position Athene, you know, annuity company. I have a Citibank. I have a big position in Cigna. Uh, seems very cheap at a single digit multiple. Mr. Cooper's a very large position. It's worked out quite nicely for me. Uh, energy transfer ET yields 18%. I expect a dividend to be cut. Uh, whenever a stock yields 18%, either the stock goes up or the dividend gets cut. I expect the dividend to get cut and the stock to go up when we do that. Um, I have Microsoft. I have Navient. The student loan company yields, I think, 7%. Uh, I think very cheap. Uh, Any commodities in the picture? No, I've actually uh, been very hypocritical. I've been sitting on my I, When I say commodity, I have a 4% position in the aggregate and the energy, which has hurt me quite a bit. But I think oil is cheap in the market. And I think, you know, if you're a capitalist, basically, um, at the end of the day, uh, when companies generate very high rates of return on capital, it tracks competition and capacity. And when companies generate very low rates of return on capital, it, track, it, 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 it uh, leads with excess of capital and capacity. And uh, so I would say that uh, you're gonna need 50 to $60 oil to attract new capacity coming in. If the economy globally grows, right. supply demand will tighten up. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, right now, nobody cares about, it. I mean, the Jimmy Kramer who's a fine guy. He's become a bit of a momentum guy on TV. He says, uh, energy is not investable. Mm. You know, yeah. uh, I would tend to think that would probably be a bad comment. Yeah, well, correct comment. In Canada, we hope so. Um, let me let me just. Wrap I'm up. saying I, I feel hypocritical. I I digress to oil. I've been I don't own any gold, but I think given the world that I see, I probably should own some gold. Mm -hmm. Now I own a couple Canadian uh, uh, miners. Uh, the mines are not in Canada, but they're based in Canada. I own Sierra Metals which I think has an NAV three times the price of stock. They're sitting on a, a very good balance sheet. They announced in January intent to buy back, I think 10% of the company. And because of the virus, they canceled it, but they're back all three mines they have are working and they're generating a lot of cash. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's one. Another one, which is more risky because it's only one commodity. Sierra has gold, silver, zinc, copper. It's multi polymetal. Right. The other one I own, which is also based in Canada, is Largo Resources. Mm -hmm. The second largest manufacturer of vanadium in the world. Vanadium is used as a strengthening alloy. Uh, and they have like, I think, 70 million in cash and no debt on the balance sheet, generating free cash. So I have a few things like that where I'm patient, where they're illiquid. And I own, it would take me a long time to unload. But because I don't worry about redemptions, I'm willing to play that game. Right. No, that's great. I mean, first of all, Lee, thank you for sharing um, some of the kind of positions you're holding. Let me ch change subjects because we only have a couple minutes left. I really want to zero in on something that you and, and your wife, Toby, have been quite remarkable with. Um, you guys have been extraordinary, extraordinarily charitable. Like you said, you're committing all of your wealth to the Giving Pledge. So that kind of even within that echelon of top givers, you're kind of in the top of that echelon. Wh when did that start and how has your uh, fo philanthropy focus changed over the years? Uh, well, it's become bigger where I fund whole projects. So I've given a very lot. I created something called the Cooper Family Fund for Jewish Future, where I send kids to Birthright Israel. I, I give them a stipend for summer camps, and I support Hillel's at local college campuses. Get a major gift called the Cooper College Scholars, where I put $25 million into a fund to pay college tuition for 500 kids in Essex County, New Jersey all kids of color that deserve an opportunity. I'm big on creating equal opportunity. I'm not, I'm, I'm big on, you know, teaching people how to fish, not giving people fish. Right, right. Okay, um, so I, I got, I guess I go back, I set up my foundation in 1985 when my income started to exceed my cost of living. And I concluded when I reflected and thought about it, that there's only four things you can do with money when you think about it. The first thing you can do with money is you pleasure yourself and buy homes and buy art and buy planes and stuff like that. Now, if you're an art collector, you never have enough money because you know, today you can pay $100 million for a canvas. I'm not an art collector, 
And I also have a view that material possessions brings with them aggravation. Right. Uh, there's another pool guy to worry about, another roofer, another gardener. So I, I, I'm of the view less is more. So my income and my assets uh, are greater than I need to live on because I, I don't want to have a complicated life. My wife uh, was an educator for 30 odd years. She worked with neurologically uh, impaired kids, you know, birth defect children and had a career. She was very <laughs> involved in her career. Yeah. The second thing you can do with money, give it to your kids. But if you have accumulated a lot of money, giving all your money to your kids is a big mistake because you deprive them of any sense of self-achievement. I have two boys, uh, one graduated Stanford Phi Bait, uh, ran a hedge fund very successfully, and the other one has a PhD from Oregon State. He doesn't make much money, but he loves what he does. He's an environmentalist, he's a scientist. Uh, the third thing you can do with money, so I didn't give all my money to my kids. Uh, I gave them a decent sum of money, but nothing remotely. I gave away much more money than I gave to my kids. The third thing you can do with money is to give it to the government, but only a schmuck gives the government money you don't have to give them. You know, the most knowledgeable guy of the tax structure that I know of is Warren Buffett. And he talks about rich people paying more in taxes, but he's managed to give away all his money and pay very little in taxes. Right. The fourth thing you can do with money is recycle it back into society, try to make the world a better place. And that's what I've chosen to do with my money. You know, uh, and so basically, you know, I got there that, through that way, thinking it through analytically. What do you do with money? Mm -hmm. You know, Please. And uh, I'll read you something, uh, uh, if I can find it. Uh, I, I can't find it. We have to, we're maybe shut off in, in about two minutes. So I'm, I'm gonna, okay. I'll, um, I'll, I'll, I'll kind of uh, table it here, but really Lee, that was just fantastic. I, I can't thank you enough for mm -hmm. joining us and uh, enlightening us with very enjoyable comments and uh, really appreciate it. I hope my view of the market is wrong, but I'm expecting very modest returns over the next few years. Yeah, I, you know what, I, I, I don't know, but really- I don't know either, that's my guess. We do appreciate the candor. Really, thank you for your generosity. Good luck, you keep, up, you keep up doing your good deeds. It's very good. Thank you, thank you. By the way, as a small thank you, we'll be sending you um, a little gift and, and also making a special donation in your honor. Um, oh, nice so, of you. Uh, very nice of you. You don't absolutely. have to send me anything. Don't send me anything of great, great value. Give it away to people that need it. All right, sounds great. Okay, and, take uh, care. Thank you again, Lee. Thank you.